Well, good morning, everybody, and please turn with me in God's Word to Joel chapter 3. Like Caleb said, we'll be finishing up our series today through the book of Joel. And as uh, we introduced Danny earlier as an elder candidate, want to make sure you guys know that he's actually going to be bringing the Word of God for the next two Sundays. Uh, so after we finish with Joel, Danny is going to uh, preach through the little book of 2 John and then through the little book of 3 John for the next two Sundays. So if you don't already know Danny very well, you're going to get to know him a little bit more uh, as he brings the scriptures for the next two Sundays, and then we'll move on to our next book. So let's look in Joel chapter 3. Our reading will be verses 17 through 21. Let's hear God's word together. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. And Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day, the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah will flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall become a desolation, and Eden, Edom, a desolate wilderness, for the violence done to the people of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall be inhabited forever and Jerusalem to all generations. I will avenge their blood, blood I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. Let's pray. O Lord, as the Apostle Paul sat chained in a prison cell, awaiting execution at the end of his life, he wrote to Timothy and he acknowledged that he was in chains, he was bound, his life was coming to an end. But he said these powerful words, he said, but the word of God is not bound. There was no chain, there was no iron that could restrict the spread and the power of your truth. And Lord, if the word of God could break through prison chains, then the word of God can even break through our calloused hearts this morning. And so I pray and ask that your word would be faithful to pierce whatever hardness or bitterness or stubbornness might be blocking us from receiving your truth this morning. I ask, Lord, that you would speak to your people through your word, that you would summon us unto the excellencies of Jesus who died for us and rose again, that we might have eternal life, and may he be glorified in this time. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, at this time, the children are welcome to head back to Sunday school. And for the rest of you, I actually owe you guys an apology, because it's been at least a couple weeks since I've made a Lord of the Rings or J.R.R. Tolkien reference. Uh, rest assured, we're about to remedy that right now. So most of you are probably familiar with the Lord of the Rings stories. If you haven't read the books, first of all, you need to. But second of all, you've probably seen the movies. And you know that at the end of this epic trilogy, you've got this fellowship that is on the quest to destroy this evil ring, this ring that a dark lord used to enslave all the world. And these books can get into the gritty darkness of good struggle against evil. And at the end of the final book, one of the characters, whose name is Samwise Gamgee, or Sam, Sam wakes up at the very end of the book, and the last thing Sam knew was that it looked like the world was falling apart. He called it the end of all things. It looked like the world itself was crumbling. But through this great turn of good, now evil has been defeated. And there's this beautiful scene at the end of the final book where Sam wakes up and he sees this friend, Gandalf, the wise wizard, who he thought was dead, who he thought had been perished. And listen to how Tolkien describes this beautiful scene. The evil has been vanquished. The good guys are all united again. Sam lay back and stared with open mouth, and for a moment, between bewilderment and great joy, he could not answer. At last he gasped, Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? A great shadow has departed, said Gandalf, and then he laughed, and the sound was like music or like water in a parched land. And as he listened, the thought came to Sam that he had not heard laughter, the pure sound of merriment, for days upon days without count. It fell upon his ears like the echo of all the joys he had ever known. But he himself burst into tears. Then, as sweet rain will pass down a wind of spring, and the sun will shine out the clearer, his tears ceased, and his laughter welled up, and laughing, he sprang from his bed." What a beautiful scene describing how the shadow of evil has once and for all departed and the sadness felt has been transformed into laughter. And I love the line there where Sam asked the question, is everything sad going to come untrue? If you want to get some good eschatology, read J.R.R. Tolkien because throughout the Lord of the Rings books, there's this constant emphasis on 
when good triumphs over evil once and for all, all of the sadness and misery of the fallen order are restored and redoubled. Life is full of sadness. Sadness comes in many forms. Perhaps there's disappointment when something didn't go our way. Perhaps there was hurt, whether it be physical pain or whether it be emotional hurt. Perhaps there's loss. You are separated from someone that you love. Someone has betrayed your confidence or someone has departed. All of these things are regular parts of our human experience in this world. Life is full of sadness. And yet, throughout the book of Joel, we have seen God constantly working renewal. And you know what's interesting is that throughout Joel, I think the two themes we've seen is judgment and renewal. Judgment and renewal. And these two themes have sort of happened in sort of a cycle. Each cycle escalating uh, in, in its impact. So think about judgment, for example. We first saw judgment in the form of a locust plague in chapter 1. Well, then that judgment gets repeated, but it's, it's increased in the form of these invading nations in chapter 2. And then last week in chapter, the beginning of chapter 3, we saw judgment culminating in this, this final promised day where everybody stands before the judgment throne of God. So this theme of judgment heightens from a locust invasion to a nation invading to the great throne judgment before God. But we've also seen this theme of renewal and restoration. We saw in chapter 2, verses 18 through 27, there will be a renewal, a restoration of the years and the land that the locust had eaten. We saw at the end of chapter 2, the spiritual renewal of God's people brought about by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then now, today, we read about the renewal or the restoration of the cosmic order itself, of reality, of the entire created order, gets renewed. That all that is wrong with the world gets fixed once and for all. Throughout Joel, we've seen God bring smaller judgment leading up to climactic judgment. But we've also seen God giving smaller renewal leading up to this ultimate renewal when all sad things become untrue. Now, many of us, I think it's interesting when you observe human nature, every human, whether they are religious or not, has some yearning for this, this future day when the world is fixed. We talked about it at the beginning of the book. No matter what system or worldview or religion you belong to, everybody has this hope that someday the world can be made right. Because everybody looks out their window and sees not everything's right with the world. How many people will say, we live in such a messed up world? Or people will say, here's what's wrong with the world. All belief systems have that in common, and all belief systems have some idea of what needs to be done to fix the world. Because here's the thing we need to keep in mind. Whenever we, as maybe a, a secular, materialistic society, say things like something is wrong with the world or the world is messed up, that assumes two different things. One, it assumes that there is a goal or purpose for the world that it is deviated from. Right? Something can't be wrong unless there is a right goal. Unless there is a plan from which you are deviating, you can't say something is wrong. At the same time, there are also re moral realities to which the wor world should conform. There is a moral way that the world should be. And the fact that the world is not that way means something is wrong. But here's the thing. If there is no God, if the world is just an accidental product, then there is nothing wrong with the world. That's just the way it is. You and I may not like it. We may not care for it. It may not be enjoyable, but there's nothing wrong with it because there is no good plan or ideal that it's deviated from. That's just the nature of things. So it's nonsensical for someone in an anti-theistic worldview to say something is wrong with the world. No, all you can say is you just don't like the world the way that it is. But the Christian can say with confidence, the world is not right because there was a good design that sin has distorted. And not only do we have that understanding, but we also can go even further and say we have a guarantee that it's going to be made right someday. And we don't have to lock up our hopes for the world being made right in the public school system or the perfect form of government or the perfect president or anything like that. Our hope for the world's renewal is the hope in the creator who made it in the first place. A creator who cares about his creation so much, he will not ultimately let it fail. The design of the world has strayed from what it was designed to be. But what we have here in Joel is a promise that the designer will restore it in the end. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe you've had daydreams about what heaven will be like. Or maybe you've envisioned, what would, be the per what would that look like when all is made right and everything is perfect? And a lot of the times, our visions of what heaven or eternity will be like are kind of impacted by our own, again, personal preferences. So when I was a kid, 
I imagined heaven being a big baseball field because I loved baseball. I saw everything was baseball. I, I breathed it. I would play it. I would collect the cards. I would practice it. I would watch it. I would listen to the games. I'd follow the stats. Everything was baseball, baseball, baseball. So when I thought of the absolute perfect existence, it was a giant baseball field. Well, the problem for some of you is that <laughs> sounds more like the other place because maybe, maybe you don't care for baseball. Here's the thing. The eternity that God has planned when he restores all things is so much better than just one individual's preferences. In that eternal restoration, God brings to fulfillment what we all universally need. In the final restoration, God fixes the needs that we all have in common. Not simply my desire to play baseball, but there are deep transcendent needs that I have, that you have, and that every human that's ever existed has. And the restoration of the created order brings about the restoration of those needs. And so what we're going to look at today through this text is actually seven of those. I know, seven points. I'll try to keep them brief. Uh, but seven things that I think this text shows us about uh, seven sadnesses that come untrue when God fixes everything once and for all. And these, again, will be seven universal needs that we all have that are not currently met in their fullness due to the fallen order of things, but God does promise to fix. So let's look at the first one. The first need, the first sadness that comes untrue is this, a restored relationship with God. The divide between man and God will come undone. God will be with us forever, and we will never be apart from him again. Look at verse 17. You shall know that I am the Lord your God. There is an intimate awareness and knowledge and comprehension. It's an experiential comprehension that God is our Lord, and he dwells in Zion. He dwells amongst the people of God, and the people of God dwell with him. You know why this is so beautiful? Because one of the biggest sadnesses we feel as humans is a disconnect from God. Every single person has what you might call a God instinct or a God-shaped hole. It's a universal phenomena. It has been present in every civilization that's ever existed. People feel this built-in draw towards religion. Why? Because we, uh, we have this collective understanding there is something bigger than myself for which I am made. And we are not satisfied until we are rightly connected to whatever that higher thing is. And yet, for that need... Don't we feel this collective separation from God? Don't we all feel there's this distance? God feels hidden. We feel alienated from God. Where is he? I look for him. There's many people who have tried different faith systems and they've tried to be good enough or they've tried all these things and yet God feels like this distant enigma. Why can't I catch him? Well, that's why we have all these false religions in the world because we have tried every which way of our own effort to bridge the gap. We feel the weight of the divide between us and God and in our sin, we invent new systems that we think will bridge that gap, that we think will restore us to him. Our view of God has become muddied and distorted. And so the need for God doesn't go away. We just try to fulfill it in all the wrong ways and in all the wrong places. And so Jesus came to restore that relationship. Jesus tore the veil. That's where that significant imagery of the veil being torn comes from. In the temple, the big, thick veil that's like 40 feet high symbolizes the divide between holy God in his sanctuary and fallen man in his sin. And when Jesus died on the cross and took the full punishment that we deserve, that veil was torn because access to God has been reopened through his son. And now by faith in Jesus, we have access into the holy of holies. Jesus was cast out on the cross that we might be brought near. But let's be honest, even on our strongest days, don't we still feel a bit of a divide? Even for someone who loves Jesus with all their heart, there's no shadow of a doubt in your mind that he died for your sins. Aren't there days where we still feel this sort of separation? Aren't there days where God still feels hidden to us, where we cry out and we wonder if someone's really listening? There are these certainly rare moments where we experience his presence, where it's so, I can look back at a handful of times in my life where there is such a heightened awareness of God's presence. But those we call mountaintop experiences for a reason, because they're rare. Most of life feels like it's lived in the valley. 
And then you have those special occasions that have this intimate time with God. Most of life, though, is lived in the valley where our view of God's presence doesn't seem so clear. And maybe you are in that type of season right now. Maybe your walk with the Lord feels more like a long-distance relationship. You know that he loves you. You know he's there, but you don't feel really closely connected to him. You love him, but you feel this weight of space. God sometimes feels more like an abstract idea than a personal being. You know he's there, but trying to get access to him feels a little bit like trying to breathe through a straw. It's there, but barely, if at all. Your prayer life is either non-existent or perhaps it feels mechanical. You admire the Bible, but let's be honest, when you read it, the words are not like a sword piercing through to your soul. They read stale, not as the voice of the living God speaking to you. Now, if you are in that season right now, or you've had one before, you know it will probably happen again. There are seasons where our walk with God is invigorating and real, but there are many seasons where it just does not seem to stay constant. That is the difficulty of living in this fallen world, in this lifetime. But what we have here in Joel is this promise of ultimate restoration where that tension goes away, where we no longer feel that gap between us and God anymore. What Jesus started on the cross and achieved for us comes to its glorious consummation when God dwells with his people. And the great eternal reality we anticipate is only an unbroken perpetual closeness with him. When Christ returns and all sadness is undone, this will be the great reality of every one of Christ's people, is a perpetual closeness with God, never to have a long-distance relationship deal going on again. The second thing we see, though, is restored holiness in verse 17. Our failures and shortcomings will, will come undone. We'll be made perfect, and we'll never do bad things again. Look at verse 17. It says, Jerusalem, that's where God dwells with his people. Jerusalem shall be holy and strangers shall never again pass through it. This sounds a lot like Revelation 21, 27, which says it speaks of the new Jerusalem, same thing. And it says nothing unclean will ever enter it. This is a city where holiness dwells. Only that which is holy is in this city. That sounds great, doesn't it? Nothing impure, nothing defiled, uh, no dirty TV shows, no horrible jokes, nothing bad ever happens. Sounds like the place to be. Now, as I read this passage, it sounds like a great deal at first until I start thinking about the things that I've done and the things that I've thought and the things that I've said. And I, I come to this horrible realization that if this is a place where only absolute holiness dwells, I'm not sure I meet the qualifications for residency. But here's where the good news comes in. Because God undoes the reality of our own imperfection. God undoes the reality of our lack of holiness so that we are fit vessels to live in this holy Jerusalem. This is a process that's called glorification. Glorification is the final state for believers. Where So you can think about uh, the, the, the way that Jesus deals with our sin in three stages. The first stage is called justification. And that's where Jesus deals with the penalty for our sin. On the cross, Jesus took the full punishment of sin for you and for me. The next stage is what we're undergoing right now. It's called sanctification. And that's where the power of sin over us is being progressively broken as we're conformed to the image of Christ. But all of this consummates in the final stage, which is glorification. And in glorification, God removes the total presence of sin from all his people. No more wicked thoughts. No more deceptive feelings. No more ill intentions. No more crass words. No more actions that make us say, why on earth did I do that? God perfects and purifies his people unto holiness once and for all. Because of the work of Jesus, this wondrous hope means that all the imperfection in me and in you becomes done away with once and for all in the holy city of Jerusalem. Now, that seems a little hard to picture right now. Because how often do you look at yourself and your own life and you feel racked with frustration because no matter how hard I try, I just can't seem to be the perfect person I want to be? How many of us can relate with Paul's words in Romans 7, 15? I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. You ever relate with that? I know what I should do, but how come I don't do it? And I know what I ought to do, I don't do it. And what I ought not do, I do that very thing. What is wrong with me? He's saying, I don't understand myself. There's many mysteries that man has been able to probe and figure out. And yet one of the great mysteries we can't quite understand is, Ourselves, why do we sin? What is wrong with me? Well, it's because we have a corrupt, sinful nature. 
and this fallenness of man, our imperfection as a race. You know, this is one of the most universally observable confirmations of the Bible's theology. You know, there are certain things like the Trinity I can't appeal to by using, uh, you know, pointing you to something in nature and say, look, the Trinity, right? God reveals that through Scripture. But there is a doctrine that the Bible speaks about that I can point to any number of things and say, look, it proves the Bible, and that is the depravity of man. You, can, you don't have to look very far to find out this doctrine of sinfulness. This is universally observable. But in our more secular age, there's been a bit of a shift in terms of how do we deal with this? What do we do with this imperfection? How do we deal with our sin? And I think this change in our current age has come about through two major shifts. The first shift was what I would call from divine change to self-improvement. You hear that? The first shift was from divine change to self-improvement. It used to be believed that man required divine assistance in order to change. Since sin originated from within us, we couldn't look inwardly for the solution because that's where the problem came from, right? So what we needed was a higher power, in this case, God, to produce divine change in us. We needed God to change us, to remove us out of unholiness and conform us to holiness. But as culture shifted from a theistic worldview into a more anti-theistic worldview, we stopped believing in the work and power of God. And so where did we look to for this change? We looked to ourselves for help. So instead of divine change, we started looking at methods of self-improvement. And the solution to my unholiness comes from the self. This was basically our attempt to do for ourselves what we previously looked to God to do. But you know what? This task proved to be impossible. Because no one can muster up enough change within themselves to be what we should be. And so what ended up happening was without this ability to really change himself, man made the next significant shift. He said, okay, self-improvement isn't going to work, so what do I do? I can't go back to divine help because I don't accept the idea of God, and I can't improve myself, so what do I do? That's the second shift, which moved to self-acceptance. In other words, the problem with me is not the problem with me. The problem with me is that I think there's a problem with me. So self-acceptance required maxims like love yourself and be true to yourself. The solution to our problems was not to see the problem solved, but deny there was even a problem in the first place. The way to alleviate the guilt for our wrongdoing is deny that we had done any wrongdoing and learn to accept yourself, warts and all, and say, this is beautiful. I'm already everything that I should ever be, and anybody who tells me different is just being mean and judgmental. It denies that there was ever a problem. And yet, our age of self-acceptance has produced a higher degree of insecurity and identity crisis and depression than ever before. It's almost like the more we tell ourselves there's no sin problem, the more painful the burden becomes. Because it hasn't gone away, we've just ignored it. It's almost like the emperor can tell himself how stylish he is all he wants, but the longer he walks down the street, the worse his naked predicament becomes. Now, if we drop the therapeutic slogans for just a moment and we honestly examine ourselves, the recognition of our failures and the self-loathing we feel as a result of those, those failures is still very much there. You can tell yourself you're special and perfect and beautiful all you want, but in the, the, the corner of your soul, you know those failures are there. The question is, what are we going to do with them? In the dark and terrifying corners of our own private thoughts and emotions, we know there's a problem, and no amount of self-coddling is going to remove it. So what hope do we have? Well, the solution is Christ. Maybe, maybe it's time that we cycle back to that original trail that we departed from and we realize that Jesus and Jesus alone can take away the full penalty of that sin. And the power of the Holy Spirit alone can break the power of that sin over me. And in this great eschatological hope when all things sad come untrue, that's my only hope for the total presence of sin being undone. God perfects us in that final day. God perfects us into the best possible version of ourselves there is a wonderful christian band called the gray havens and the gray havens does a song called uh, when i see you again and it's a song about uh, a loved one a believer who has departed into glory and they're looking forward to when they're reunited on that great day of undone sadness and there's a line in there where he says to his friend i always knew you could be like this i saw flashes and glimpses before Right now, as we interact with each other, we see flashes and glimpses of the full good potential that we all possess because of God's good creation. But we see that distorted, don't we, because of sin. 
And so in eternity, what God does is he restores that full image so that we are the best possible holy version of ourselves that we could never do for ourselves, but that God perfects in eternity. So if you are feeling crushed by the weight of your own inability to do what you're supposed to do, by the own, your own lack of holiness, take heart. That sad reality of sin will come untrue once and for all. Let's look to our third thing. We see in verse 18, a restored creation as the frustration and danger of the natural world will be undone. We see there that nature itself is perfected. There will never be bad weather, dangerous plants or animals, lack of food and water, anything. Look at verse 18. And in that day, the mountains shall drip sweet wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. It envisions this place where wine, milk, and water are gushing everywhere, almost as though it's just pouring out of the hills and mountains themselves. What a glorious reversal this is of Genesis chapter 3, where God said, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, by which you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. You know, the natural world can be so beautiful, but kind of like people. There's a lot of beautiful potential, but it's also marred by sin, isn't there? And so when you look out at nature and you live in this world, there's a lot of frustration. We don't always have the shelter that we need or the food or the water. We experience severe heat, severe shivering and cold. We have the irritation of illnesses that won't go away. We have bad weather. You know, sometimes nature can just be straight up dangerous. Think about this. The wrong kind of mushroom, right? A mushroom could be a wonderful, wonderful little snack, but you get the wrong kind and it can kill you. Our main source of energy, the sun, can give us cancer. Water, which we need for survival, can drown us. Those majestic creatures you love watching on the animal documentaries, you get too close and they could gore you, claw you, bite you, crush you, even eat you. You can't name a wondrous part of God's good creation that because of sin can't inflict destruction on humans. And so our enjoyment of the natural world, if you're somebody and you love going on hikes, you love bird watching, you love having a picnic in a green open field, we have to understand that love of God's creation, it's always a half-baked deal because that, that same creation can either be a source of beauty and life or it can be a source of misery and death. And so you've probably heard me say this a lot, but I'll, I'll continue to say it. I think one of the biggest misconceptions Christians have about eternity is we think that God zaps planet Earth and the natural realm gets obliterated, and we are just sort of disembodied spirits floating around in clouds. The Bible constantly presents the opposite. It's not that the natural order gets removed, but that it gets restored. God doesn't chuck out his creation. He fixes it. And so it's not that the physical realm and God's good creation, that when he looked over it on the seven days and he pronounced it's very, very good, God doesn't ultimately throw it in the cosmic waste paper basket. God fixes it to what it was designed to be, just like you and just like me. And I think there's actually some beautiful uh, little pictures of this in the gospel itself. I want us to think for a moment, when Jesus was crucified and he was up on the cross, what did he have on his head? It was a crown of thorns, right? What, what did the thorns represent back in Genesis 3? That's what God told Adam. He said that from the, this fallen ground, there will be thorns and thistles for you. Thorns were a mark of the fall of a cruel and oppressive nature. But what happens to Jesus' crown of thorns in his resurrection? Oh, it gets transformed into a crown of glory, doesn't it? What about when Jesus died? Where was he buried? He was buried in a tomb, this chamber of death. But then he emerges again. And where was the tomb located? In a garden. And in fact, one of the first witnesses, Mary Magdalene, thinks Jesus is the gardener. What a wonderful mistake to make because in a way he kind of is. He's the gardener of this new creation. And so these themes of fallenness, the thorns are transformed into a beautiful crown and the tomb is transformed into a garden. This is what God does through Christ. The fallen order gets renewed. And this comes through the resurrection of Christ himself because Jesus is the first of the resurrection to come. The resurrection of believers, but the resurrection of the entire order itself. Romans 8 says that all creation is longing for our glorification. You hear that? Creation is longing for our glorification. Why? Because that's when creation gets glorified as well. Because all things are then made new. And Jesus is the first of that great resurrection to come. And Jesus is a testimony of that right now. Because Jesus at the right hand of the Father has his resurrected body 
That is a testimony to the fact that you and I in creation get restored in the footsteps of our Lord. Listen to this passage from Isaiah 11. This is a messianic prophecy about the Messiah. It says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. What a glorious hope to look forward to. Let's move on to point number four. We see, we see a restored satisfaction as futility and meaninglessness will be undone. Look at verse 18 again. It says, A fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord. You know, water is often used in the Bible as a picture of satisfaction. What is satisfaction? Satisfaction is a need or a desire that gets fulfilled. Satisfaction is when we have some deep longing or need within us that gets met, that is filled in a good and fulfilling way. When you are hungry and your body gets the nutrients and the food, you feel satisfied. Uh, fulfillment of the body means fulfillment of things like hunger, thirst, tiredness. When you get the night's sleep you need or a refreshing drink of water, your body feels satisfied. But we know that we are not just bodies made up of atoms and molecules, are we? We are also souls. And so there is a spiritual need we all have. There is a spiritual satisfaction for which every human longs. Everybody can testify there is a deeper need that no material food or drink or comfort can satisfy. This is, I think, another problem for the materialist who thinks that there is no spiritual realm. Because if you and I are material creatures, then how come nothing material can ultimately satisfy us? It's almost as though we were meant for something more. And so fountains and water are often powerful pictures of this deep thirst of the soul in Scripture because the longing of the soul, I think, can, can be compared to one of the strongest desires known to the human body, and that is the desire of thirst. There is almost no urge that is more powerful than the need for water. You know, you could survive maybe a couple weeks without food, but you won't be able to make it a couple days without water. Go and read the, the, the first-hand testimony of someone who was maybe stranded, stranded in the desert or stuck in a raft on the sea, and they're not able to drink the salt water around them. Read the stories of people who did not have access to water for even just a couple days, and it was like literally going through hell because it is one of the most horrible experiences a human can undergo. Now, we live in a very wet climate in Florida. We get monsoons every day, and there's swamps on every corner. We have a hard time imagining being without water very long. But for the, the Middle Eastern readers who first received these words, they would have known all too well what it's like when there's a drought, when you're stranded in the desert, when you don't have access to water. You know how devastating that is? And yet, that same sort of Thirst is also true of the human soul. It's what prompted the author of Ecclesiastes to write in chapter 1, vanity of vanity, all is vanities. Some translations say meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. What does man gain by all the toil for which he toils under the sun? How many of us run high and low seeking fulfillment or gratification and everything under the sun and none of it can quench the thirst of our soul? That is the state of many in the world today. You know, we live in one of the most materialistically comfortable societies of all human history. And yet when you read the news or you look on social media, you see a nation of people whose souls are still thirsty. We have, from a beastly perspective, we have everything you could ever ask for. We have more than enough food, more than enough shelter, more than enough water, more than enough people around us. And yet there is still something critical missing because nothing in the material world can provide ultimate satisfaction. That's why these words of Christ are so incredible. In John chapter 4, verses 13 through 14, he was passing through Samaria, and he was by a well, and a Samaritan woman comes up to him, a Samaritan woman who had gone through a string of men. She had had, what, four or five husbands and was now living with a man who was not even her husband. She had bounced through relationships. She was an outcast of her society. She had sought satisfaction in all sorts of places and couldn't find it. And she, Jesus said this to her, he looked at the well and he said, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. Jesus offers us a living spiritual water that will quench us eternally. And he says, the water, listen to this, the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water 
welling up to eternal life. This has two movements to it. Jesus gives you the water now, and it becomes a fountain. So if you put your trust in Christ, that satisfaction begins now. It starts as a stream within us. But what we see here in Joel is this great hope that it turns into a, a, a bursting fountain for all time. And that's why Jesus said it wells up to eternal life. It starts now as a stream. But as we enter into that eternal state, it bursts out into this overwhelming river of eternal life. And we drink deep of satisfaction from Christ for all time. Let's look at point number five. We see a restored freedom in verse 19. It says, Egypt shall become a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness for the violence done to the people of Judah because they've shed innocent blood in their land. This is envisioning a day where Israel's enemies, Edom, Egypt, those nations that used force and military aggression and tyranny to torture the innocent, it envisions a day where they are made desolate and because of the innocent blood they spilled, they will be eradicated once and for all. And so this great hope when sadness comes undone is that oppression and violence themselves will be undone. Think with me back how human history is often the long, sad story of oppression and violence. Think about the Hebrew slaves hauling Egyptian bricks for hundreds of years. Think about the Romans dumping innumerable quantities of slaves into a gladiator arena to be butchered before a cheering crowd. Think about ancient Rome with streets lined with crosses on which thousands of criminals were publicly subjected to the slow, humiliating, agonizing death of crucifixion. Think of all the, if you really want a good time to lose your lunch, go and just do a Google search on medieval torture methods and it will, it will make you feel queasy to see what human beings have been capable of doing to other humans. I had read one time, you know, one of the things that separates human from, humans from animals is humans are the only ones that actively think of the most perverse ways imaginable to make other humans suffer. And I think that's exactly right. We are incredibly creative, but in some really, really vicious way, in really vicious ways. Think of the slave trade as countless men, women, and children were hauled from their homes to be treated like animals in a faraway land. Think about the Nazi concentration camps and the communist gulags of the 20th century where people were treated with the absolute inhumanity as they shrank away to little more than skeletal forms of what used to be a human being, treated with absolute barbarism, children subjected to this thing. You know, I remember one of, one of the most, I think one of the saddest things I've ever seen was last year we went on a field trip to the Holocaust Museum in St. Petersburg. And that's, a, that's something that will really move you. Like, that is not a fun field trip. That, that, that's a weighty experience to be had. And we're going through it, and you're reading about these terrible things, and, and there's one point halfway through the museum where you come to a little glass display case. And there in the top left corner of the display, cake, display case is this little pair of shoes. A little pair of shoes that had once belonged to a little toddler who had been taken away in the whole Holocaust and who had suffered these unspeakable things. Humans have committed atrocities upon each other. What a terrible thing. But you know, not just in the big ways, we are cruel to each other in a million small ways. Think about the thieves who beat and who hijack cars and who steal from the innocent, who rob people at ATMs. Think about the parents who abuse their children. Think about the bully who terrorizes smaller children. Whether large or small, the shedding of innocent blood, listen to this, we see in Joel, the shedding of innocent blood is swallowed up by a glorious liberty from all violence once and for all. What a glorious hope. Don't you look forward to that day when all of the cruelty of mankind is but a dream long gone and what is instead is this glorious new reality of peace and joy? And why is this possible? This is possible because the ultimate act of torture was suffered by Christ for us. And in Christ's blood, all unjust bloodshed will come undone once and for all. Let's go to our sixth point. We're almost to the end. We might actually pull off seven points today. Number six, we see, we see a restored civilization as loneliness and division will be undone. Look at verse 20. But Judah, in contrast to those destroyed nations, Judah shall be inhabited forever and Jerusalem to all generations. You know, loneliness and division are two of the great flaws we often experience. Think about all the ways we experience loneliness and, and division. 
Perhaps you spend all your days wondering, what do people really think about me? You know, I think they're my friends. I think they're my family. But I'm sure they're actually saying bad things about me behind my back. Maybe there's a loved one you miss who's gone. Maybe they live on the other side of the country. Maybe they've departed. Mankind is frequently marked by envy, rivalry, suspicion. Even the church has been torn apart by divisions. Families have been ripped asunder by divorce, feuds, bitterness. And yet, what do we read here? Yet Judah shall be inherit, inhabited forever. There is fellowship, and it is unbroken. It says it will be forever. Think with me for a second about loneliness. Loneliness is something we've all encountered before. Maybe you're in a season right now. Maybe you don't have someone to love, or you feel like there is no one to love you. Or maybe you have loneliness because there is someone you love, but you can't be with them for whatever reason. You're separated by distance or perhaps by death. Maybe you really want to be married. You wished you had a life partner, but God has not brought along the right person. Maybe there, for whatever reason, you experience loneliness and you wish there was another person to fill this void in your life and they are not there. We experience loneliness. But we also experience division because even when we have people in our life, we still experience a sort of relational divide with them because they exist, I'm near them, but there's a relational distance because we have some unresolved dispute. This is true of nations. As you could have someone who is a fellow American who you have disputes with. It happens within people groups. It happens within churches. It even happens within our own families. Think about the, maybe you're not a lonely person, but you experience a lot of division. Within the walls of your own home, there is constant strife and fighting. I'm willing to wager that possibly even it happened for many of you, many, I should say many of us, this morning, getting ready to leave for church, you experience the result of, of division in a family, trying to get out the door on time. And so what we see here, though, in verse 20 is there is a restored civilization as loneliness and division are undone forever. And this reminds me of what Revelation 21 says. He says, I saw the new city, or the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And listen to what it says there. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. With this Jerusalem that we just read about in verse 20, Revelation elaborates on the Jerusalem here of verse 20, and it tells us about what this city will be like. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain of death. There will be no more mourning for missing somebody, no more pain inflicted on one another. Loneliness and division will be undone. We will be with God's family forever, and there will be absolute unity of God's people in Christ. Now we come to our last thing, point number seven. Verse 21, we see that there is restored justice as all traces of evil are undone. Now, I want to point out something in the verse here. It says, I will avenge their blood, blood I have not avenged. Now, some translations might say, I will acquit their blood guilt that I have not acquitted. Now, does the verse say, I will avenge their blood or I will acquit their blood? There's a world of difference between those two words. Well, it's hard to say because in the Hebrew, the word means empty or clear. So God is saying either I will empty and clear their blood, which could mean either I will pay it back, or it could mean I will remove the guilt of it. Which is it? Now, I, I can't say which one the text means, but I can tell you that both are true in Christ. Both are true. There's a sense in which those who are God's enemies, who have not repented, the evil they have done will be repaid. Justice will be dealt in the final scales of God's courtroom. And all evil things will be paid back once and for all. We talked about this last week. There is no sin, no matter how great or minuscule, that will remain undealt with. But at the same time, for the believer, it's true our sins are acquitted. Why? Did God remove his standard of justice? Did God say, well, you know, for you guys, I'm going to let the law slip. No, it's because Jesus took that full justice for us on the cross. So in the end, God's justice is always dealt out. The only question is, will it be dealt out on the sinner or on Jesus, the substitute? But there is no lack of justice in the final equation. And so justice will be restored. All traces of evil will be definitively dealt with and undone, either on the unrepentant sinner themselves or on the one who has received the free gift of salvation through Christ, because Christ paid that judgment for us on the cross. Both are true because of the gospel. And what a glorious day that will be when all injustices are done away with. You know, as a parent, one of the first things you learn to tell your kids is life's not fair. 
That's just the order of things. Well, guess what? Parents, here's good news. And kids, if you're sick, are you sick and tired of hearing that, here's good news. There will come a day when no parent will ever be able to say, life's not fair again. Because all things will be made fair. And all things will be just. And all things will be made right. I'm going to ask our ushers to prepare the Lord's Supper and bring it forward. And I want to close with this quote. This is a quote from Timothy Keller. If you're doing our apologetic class, uh, you're familiar with him. You started reading his book this week. Listen to what Timothy Keller says. He says, is everything sad going to come untrue? The answer of Christianity to that question is yes. Everything sad is going to come untrue and it will somehow be greater for having once been broken and lost. Things will not just be fixed, they will be fixed beyond what was originally lost in the first place. Are you here this morning in a place of sadness? Is that sadness through frustration at your own sin? Is that sadness through the loss of a loved one? Is that sadness through a lack of satisfaction with what life has to offer? Whatever sadness we bring here this morning, it has been fixed in Christ and it will be restored and undone once and for all in this glorious day of restoration that we read about in Joel chapter 3. Everything sad has started to come untrue in Jesus and will definitively come untrue on that glorious day. Let's praise God for this gift and for what he's given us in Christ through his death and resurrection.